<clears throat> All right, welcome to Artcasters episode 350. This is the show where we talk about the ins and outs of cartooning, illustration, graphic design, and uh, comics and animation, and definitely more comics and animation. So um, uh, this week we have a really good guest that I'm really excited to get into introducing. Um, uh, somebody I met at LA Comic Con, so maybe we'll do a bit of a con wrap up as sure. well. Um, but before we get into introducing our guests, we'll just do our go around and introduce everybody else. So um, you're on my channel. I'm Joshua Kemble. If you haven't yet, click, click subscribe, uh, hit the bell so you get notifications when we're about to go live. And if you have interest in independent, independent comic books um, about uh, doomed romance, that's like if you took Eternal Sunshine for the Spotless Mind and put it in a blender with Ghost World. Uh, pick up Jacob's Apartment uh, from a bookstore or Two Stories, my other graphic novel that's autobiographical. It talks about faith and mental illness. Um, and uh, that's where you can find me and my stuff. Scott, where can everybody uh, find your work and your stuff? Yeah, so if you want uh, to check out my YouTube channel, you can go to CircWorks Art Labs on YouTube. Just do a YouTube search and it'll come up. And there you will find my series, Making Comics 101. It is a basically... It's it's how to make it's pretty much what it says how to make comics everything from coming up with your idea all the way to printing publishing and every step in between there's tons of videos there and it's uh, yeah it's it's all there it's all free on YouTube it is the most comprehensive course for free you're gonna find on YouTube um, I haven't had anyone challenge me on that but I, I'm pretty sure it still is. Um, and that's why I made it because there wasn't anything like it on YouTube. So definitely check that out. And you can also find uh, on my website, surfworks.com, you can find my comic book, Young and the Dead. I uh, still don't have the newest issue up there, but the uh, other uh, the other four issues are up. Uh, and also on there, for a limited time, I, I'm probably going to pull it going to pull this. <laughs> I keep saying this, but I'm going to pull the sale. Um, the Black Friday sale is still up for all my digital products. So all kinds of digital tools to help you make comics. Um, check those out. Those are uh, at least right now, if you're watching this later, they may not be up, but right now um, they are 50% off all those digital products. So yeah. Nice. And one of these days, one of us is going to do like a comprehensive comics course. And when you say, I'm waiting for someone to challenge me, we'll be like, challenge accepted. No. Yeah, do it. I, <laughs> but I'm, you guys should I'm check it out. It. Um, uh, and it's funny, um, our guest uh, actually had, had was familiar with those videos too, Scott. I know, you're I telling me. Yeah. <laughs> I can attest to, to Scott's uh, education and his teaching abilities. I did not know Scott before today. Um, but I know his videos and I learned a lot. I can, I can definitely attest to that. Thank you, Scott. Thank awesome. you. Thanks for watching. That's awesome. Cool. And then Corey, where can everybody uh, find your work, your animations and, uh, your rumble crumble flux? <laughs> rumble crumble flux. <laughs> yes. My rumble crumble flux. Uh, yeah. You can find, uh, Cr can find crumble the flux. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find uh, my recent stuff, which is the esoteric crumble flux. Things that we should be concerned about that we're not uh, are uh, those are available on my website at coreycur.com. And nice. I just uh, released one yesterday about the death of bees and how the wild bee population is declining and how we have a single point of failure by using only one species of bee to do 30% of our crops in the United States. So you can see what's that? Would that be similar to uh, it's random randomly the potato famine? And yeah, so the, the potato famine is a similar similar thing because had they had a variety of potatoes which were available to them at the time, uh, and, and the one species failed, uh, they would have had things back up. And that's kind of what's going on with bees right now is we're having like one type of bee that's being trucked all over uh the u.s um especially for like almonds in california and any types of flowering plants and stuff um but we're not doing the things that we need to do to support like wild bee populations which would mm. which are actually more efficient and more effective pollinators so anyway the whole the whole series is about uh different ways that society can collapse it's a really upbeat positive uh, <laughs> <look at> life <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, yeah. has ditched the dystopian topics and to talk about more happy topics like things that could ruin our world. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like everybody's stealing my thunder a little bit that all of a sudden everyone's annoyed about AI art and everything. And I've been annoyed about that for like a decade. So we're uh, so I'm moving on. Uh, no, just kidding. I'm still annoyed about that. Too. But it, I think the lesson learned with, with the bees is that is diversification. You got you got to yeah. diversify. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you anything, gotta just be, you know what I mean? You gotta just yeah. <laughs> yeah, anytime you have a single point of failure on something that is like essential, uh that's that's a that's a negative. So um I love that's it. what I'm talking that's what I was talking about this week. Next week it'll be something completely different. The the previous one was something a little bit more subtle that I'm actually more concerned about, that our society is getting stupider and that we are less interested in abstract and nuanced thought. And that's caused the collapse of, of civilizations in the past. I would so, agree with that. Yeah. Nice. Absolutely. So anyway, so if you want to, you know, look at that type of stuff, I've got an email newsletter that you can look at. And uh, yeah, I, I try to do some happy ones every once in a while, but I swear I'm a positive person outside of my art. <laughs> <laughs> I, f I feel the same way when it, whenever you write like kind of more serious, dark topics, it's like people kind of assume you're like this dark, serious person. And it tends to be quite the opposite, which is funny because I, I meet a lot of uh, writers who write comedy comics, yeah. like funny cartoonists and you meet them and they're like super depressed. <laughs> so right. It's, you know, it's uh, that's a that's a weird, uh, strange irony of our industry. Um they have a facade. It's all a facade, and on down deep of though they're, they're exactly. Dark, have you? Yeah, it's the tears of the clown, all yeah. of that fun stuff. Um, okay, so our guest, I'm really excited about. Um, I so uh, to kind of explain uh, how how our guest is on here. Um, I went to LA Comic Con and I was trying to find my booth, and they didn't have booth numbers anywhere, and so. I like I try to look it up on the app and I don't know, Paul, if you can describe. Did you are you gonna let Paul introduce himself? Yeah. Oh, so, oh sure. Uh, uh, part of it. Oh, okay. Oh, well, oh, well, I thought you were skipping right to the topic. <laughs> uh well and quickly, Paul Meyer. I'm a Bukenio doing time in Hollywood. So under the common tree is is a is a tale that that happens in right north of Albuquerque, New Mexico. So when somebody says Bucanio, that means they're from Albuquerque. Uh, and when you're doing time, that means everyone has, uh, in, in a bar in Hollywood, you walk in, you're like, what are you in for? Uh, I'm an actor. What are you in for? Uh, I'm a screenwriter. What are you in for? So I'm I'm in for writing and entertainment in Hollywood. And uh, you can find Under the Cottonwood Tree at utctbook.com or just Google Under the Cottonwood Tree. Um, but to get into what Josh was talking about, yes, it, 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 I, I ran, we basically bumped into each other looking at our cell phones, trying to figure out where our booths were. Yeah. So and, then and, you're, you're like zooming in on this app that has like the list of things and yeah. the numbers are microscopic and impossible to read. So, right. so I, I finally asked like three people, like what their booth numbers are. And then as I'm like wandering around trying to find my booth, I bump into Paul and it turns out our booths are going to be right next to each other. So we're like, okay, let's combine our forces yeah. <laughs> and so, find out. Yeah. Josh went one way. I went the other way. And we asked every everybody that was already in their booth positions, what's your number? What's your number? What's your number? And eventually we determined, okay, there's a, those are thirties, those forties. And then we found our spot, and 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 the next thing you know, we were guiding people when because people are asking us exactly. For some reason, LA Comic Con this year did not have. Uh, we we it was like they we were there before they were set up. It, yeah, it, the, new, the numbers weren't there yet. So sometimes that happens at conventions. Yeah, we quickly sure. bumped into each other, and then we happened to be next to each other, and then we just uh, chilled for uh, for three days, long hours. Oh, yeah. And so the thing that was fun about um, Paul is like Paul is writing this uh, book called Under the Cottonwood Tree. It's beautiful artwork. You guys should check it out. Um, it's all I'm ages. Marvin. Yeah. All Marvin. ages, family friendly. Um, and uh, and I noticed that it's it's uh, Latino in like uh, in, in like in the Latino comics scene. And I instantly thought of um, Hav, Javier, who we've had on the show because he 
he ran the Latino Comics Festival. So I'm like, hey, if you're in that scene, like you might know Hav. And I was like, do you know Hav? And and Paul instantly was like, yeah. So that yeah. we have a Javier connection as yeah. well. And then Javier walked in like five minutes later and we started chit-chatting. It was like, oh, you know Hav? Yeah, I know Hav. So yeah. yeah. He, Everyone he, in comics knows Hav. <laughs> pretty much a nexus of, of uh, at least definitely the Latino comic book world as well as every other comic book world, I suppose. Yeah, but anyhow, it was a funny thing. But um, but it turns out that Paul is a, a um, really strong writer. It's a strong book. Uh, my son's enjoying it so far. Um, and again, it's all ages. So, you know, if you guys are watching your parents or something like that, like it's definitely um, good for kids uh, to read and, and good good for like literary purposes and stuff like that. But um, what's also cool is just Paul's a really thoughtful, interesting guy. And we got in some really cool conversations. And I was like, we have to have you on the show. So um, so that's how we've got uh, Paul here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I'm glad to be here and, and talk to creatives. But uh, we were literally talking about places we've both been together. Because we both, not together, but separately, uh, we both saw Ray Bradbury around the corner at a um at a theater where he's putting in on his irish plays that he did and yeah we both, we both have signatures of him and it, that that play had to have gone on probably like two months maybe at the most but yeah we both saw that same play with we both have ray bradbury mm -hmm. signatures so we're like oh wow and, and we both started talking about like what are you influenced by and definitely ray bradbury so we're like that's and we just chatted the whole time so Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, I love it. So, um, so when I when I pitched uh, coming on the show, um, <clears throat> uh, the topic you kind of decided on was um, was to talk about uh, why we write and then what our inspirations are and stuff. So it's pretty cool. We'll hopefully get a little bit into Bradbury and and so on. Um, but first off, um, uh, so Paul, like um, under the cottonwood tree is i believe your first completed graphic novel right yes yes um, so why don't we talk about like i guess what i i, I guess a two-pronged question first why what 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 inspired you to become a writer and then sure. second what inspired you to write this specific book sure okay um well, I, it was funny. I was I was trying to determine like why do I write? It's it's definitely just storytelling. But why did I originally start to write? And I remember it was actually completely cathartic, and it was a therapeutic, and, and it was uh, a, 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 I think a, a, not a high school breakup, but a, a romantic mm -hmm. breakup in my twenties. And I remember thinking like, ah, oh, this is uh, so sad, blah blah blah. And I'm like, I the pen just sort of entered my my two fingers and I started writing. And then after a night of doing that, A, I felt better and B, there was a story in the paper. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And like, oh, so I, I got into journaling and I had never done that before. Um, so I think that's the origins of, of just writing. Um, but as far as under the comic tree, it actually is just based on a dream that I had when I was 10 years old. I was back in Albuquerque, we had um, a cattle in the backyard. So one morning I wake up and I'm um, I tell my older brother Carlos about the talking calf in my dream, and Carlos says, "Well, this is this sounds like a children's book. I, I I can't. This sounds like it's too cute not to write down." So he wrote it down. My eldest brother Julio illustrated it, and he they 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 did a little comic book version of it with like totally photocopied. This is 1982. So, so they, they illustrate them. They go to the, to the, uh, back then it was, it was before office Depot. There was a local stop, local shop that you just get them photocopies, pasted them all together. And, and there's like maybe one original copy of that. So, um, that was the, the beginning of under the cotton tree. I find myself years later in Hollywood auditioning, uh, working on some really terrible horror movies and uh, uh, and, and you know, mugging people on General Hospital. That was, that was my my uh, my big turn there as I was playing a mugger. But I, I was playing a cop and I was getting buried in the in the desert somewhere, actually probably near Palmdale, Josh. <laughs> I, I swear, it's got to be up there. And, and I remember getting buried multiple times and 
once because uh, my character is getting shot and then the, the, the bad guy is actually burying me in the hole. And so <clears throat> I'm headed back from Palmdale and it's sweaty. It's hot. I have to go get into my change my clothes to get to my bar. So I got a bartend that night and I pull over the side of the road and I realize I've got sand mites all over me. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't, have you ever, have, no one here has hopefully been buried in the desert before like I was. But if that ever happens to you, you're going to get out and you're going to have sand mites all over you. So I remember just knock them off going like, this is ridiculous. Why am I, why am I doing this? Why am I working for this guy? I've got to make my own stories. Yeah. So then it turned into uh, writing short films, uh, shooting short films, um, eventually taking that one childhood uh, idea that started from here and turning that into a screenplay, shopping it around Hollywood. Uh, but eventually I realized I don't have control over millions of dollars, but I do have control over um, an ad on Craigslist. And that's what I put out. And I found Margaret Hardy, who uh, knocked out the ballpark for us. And so my brother Carlos and I worked on the, the final pages of the Gravit novel. And then, and then she gave it life because she, I see it as a movie. So I see her as the camera woman, uh, the special effects, uh, the, um, the sound department, she handled it all. And, and I, th I think she did a, a fabulous job. It, it would not have been the same without her. Yeah, it's a really beautiful book, and um, the color tones and color choices. You mentioned it; it's like a inspired by like a New Mexico sunset, which for I thought sure. Yeah, my really... my brother, my nephew uh, Estevan went around and took photos of uh, uh, New Mexico sunsets, uh, little pueblo uh, houses, and, uh, and then I sent that over to Margaret, and I and I asked her. I said, uh, I said, this is your. Can you do this as your color palette, uh, New Mexican sunset? And sure enough. Uh, the cover i think she really she she got that yeah and she's never, she had never been to new mexico before so that's that's what's cool about it that's, that's great yeah it's really beautifully illustrated uh margaret hardy is a, a talented illustrator mm -hmm. um yeah so I, there's so much to mine there already that's interesting uh gary said if anyone's been buried in the desert before it's cory <laughs> <laughs> that's true cory <laughs> i I have had just a lot of near death experiences. That's not one of them though. <laughs> yeah. Uh followers of our show are familiar with like Corey almost every year almost dies in oh some weird way. And then he's got like a million almost dying stories. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um I I love the fact that you were talking about kind of like the first time you got kind of serious about writing being inspired by like um a breakup, which I think um, honestly, I can relate to that a ton. Like my first comic was about, it was inspired by a breakup because what, what better material <laughs> than, mm -hmm. than a breakup to kind of get your emotional, like, you know, uh, gears going to like, and, and the desire to kind of get something out is, sure. is pretty, I mean, I guess that's probably why there's like a million love songs, you know? Right. Um, right. but, uh, but. I, so I think there is like an element of that, like Scott and Corey, did you guys have that as well with like writing um, as, as like an inspiration, like the breakups? Well, like the breakup or the heartbreak as a motivator to like, write. Hmm. I don't, I don't, me personally, I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I don't know about you, Paul. Are, do you do music at all? I know Josh does music. So I think, I think maybe a lot if I was more musically inclined, I'd probably have a lot more of those <laughs> kind of stories. So what so what is your what is your muse? Uh yeah. my my muse is right well, I guess it wouldn't have been when I was a kid, but right now it's it's nostalgia. Most of my most of the stuff I write and draw, um it's it's inspired by things that happened to me as a kid. Um like kind of like your I mean your book, you said it was a dream you had. So yeah. So right now, my book, Young and the Dead, it's like kids versus zombies. So it's kind of, it's based on movies and things I like, like Goonies and Monster oh, Squad. Awesome. But it's also basically, what if my friends and I from back in the days lived through a zombie apocalypse? So it takes place in the 80s and, you know, and it's just got a lot of, a lot of, you know, um, callbacks to stuff like that. So I love uh, it. most, a lot of the stuff that I, I'm into is just pretty pretty heavy in nostalgia so 
I, nice. I, when, for any of the comic tree, I really was trying to do a never ending story. Um, yeah. And because it was like I, when I was a kid, I was like, there is no Chicano never ending story or, or Wizards of Oz out there. So I, I really wanted to, to try to capture that. Uh, Corey, your your inspirations? Your... I. I think I, I think I really enjoy like rabbit holes. And so like, I've always just followed, followed whatever curiosity kind of piques my interest at the time. And then there's kind of a drive once you learn enough about something to want to just make something about that. Cause I think it's like, it's like fan art for really obscure topics. That's kind of that's that's kind of where where I come from, and so I'll I'll just kind of deep dive down into a thing, and then um, if it's fiction, uh, it's usually like if you take one aspect of this and take it to a, like a logical extreme, there's usually a story there, and that's like most science fiction stuff is like, but what if this okay. one aspect of this just rapidly grow out of control um and if it's if it's nonfiction, uh then it's more like i'm interested in other people's thoughts and nuanced thinking so i, I think like we have like too much black and white stuff and so a lot of a lot of time a lot of times i'm trying to shed light on uh issues or topics or curiosities or just weirdnesses uh just because i want people to question their assumptions and question their authorities and those types of things so i think it's i think it's all it's all kind of curiosity based yeah okay cool and 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 also just statements you want to make a statement about things it sounds um not necessarily because i don't like necessarily saying that this is the answer um uh, as much as kind of shining a light on a problem or or having people question long held assumptions so that they can come to the conclusion. I'd rather I'd rather crowdsource the answers than pretend like I have them. Ah, very cool. Okay. Nice. I do think um kind of tied into that, like a lot of uh what we do too is out of like love for story. And mm -hmm. so in a weird way, kind of what you're describing is almost like writing a love letter to the types of uh, things that we loved. Um, Paul, you were saying like never ending story and wizard of Oz were like kind of an inspiration and you're like, well, why can't I have a never ending story wizard of Oz, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, and Scott's having the same, the same thing with uh, Goonies, you know, mm -hmm. like kids having an adventure. Yeah, for sure. So Paul, so um, with under the cottonwood tree, um this was inspired by a dream and then it kind of had different iterations along the way um how did how did that work like initially the dream the the impetus to take the dream and kind of make it into a story um was your brother like kind of saying like this should be a book or well the the, the dream itself my brother Carlos really saw a children's story in it and yeah. because it was because um, it was about a talking calf. And, and one of the, the, the poignant little things that the calf says is to me was because, because the calves would, would get out of the pen and we'd have to go chase it around the neighborhood and corral them back into the little uh, corral. Um, and I, I guess it was after what long day of doing that. I remember in my dream, I was, we were kind of picking on the calf and the calf turns to us and talks to us and says something to the effect of, Hey, don't pick on me. I have feelings too. <laughs> so when my brother Carlos heard that, it was like, Oh, it's like, you know, there's more than to the animal than just it's what it's going to be later on. It's, it's, it's a, it's a living creature there. So he extrapolated from that, but the iteration was, was completely of the dream. And in the dream, I wake up, uh, and it's my mom waking me up because my, my buddy Teddy is outside uh, waiting for me. But he I incorporated him into the dream as well. So it's a fun little children's story. It never got – well, actually was published a version of it in 1984 in the Quintel Soul Press. 
and they publish, uh, they're the first ones to pub publish Bless Me Ultima. And Bless Me Ultima is known as, as a, 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 a godfather of Chicano literature. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, Rodolfo Anaya uh, wrote that book. Um, so it was published in, a, in, a, in, in an anthology piece. So from that, it went to there. So really, it's, it's my brother Carlos who saw a child story, a children's story in it. But specifically, when later on, when we were, him and I started working on a screenplay, that inspiration was to tell the, our own stories as uh, Latino fairy tales uh, or never any stories. So from, but I, I needed that from being an actor. I'm like, I need to get my stories out there so I can, I don't want to talk about them. I don't want to talk about this guy's story about getting buried in the dirt all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny that buried in the dirt story reminds me a lot of um, what I hear a lot from illustrators too, where it's like quite often when you're doing uh, commercial art or illustration, you're taking somebody else's vision and kind of fully realizing it for that person. And you do that for like a decade and it does get to a point where it's like, it's less fun to do that than it is to just be able to take your own vision and make it a reality because you end up with a lot of metaphorical, um, you know, sand mites and stuff yeah. from doing that for clients long enough. And to be able to kind of have your own creative vision go from point A to, you know, Z without um, all the kind of all the middlemen that can kind of um, corrupt like an idea. It's 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 a really cool thing. I, I love um, that analogy. Everyone, everyone's wiping sand mites off of them at some point in their lives, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's like, it is it is interesting <laughs> to me that journey because I think we've all had very similar stories of like, of, of finding ourselves doing work for other people and realizing like, I, I need to actually take the time to kind of make my own vision happen, you know? Um, so speaking of like making your own vision happen, um, what is... Uh, so what is the process like, as opposed to like the shorter story, um, first writing a script and was that your first script, um, that uh, writing the script for it? Um, I, I toyed around with, with other, uh, screenplays and I had, a, a so once I realized I'm like, I have to tell my own stories, uh, um, I said, I, I have to educate myself on, on the art of screenplay writing and and it really is it's just a blueprint for for something else it's not it's not as an it's a lone piece it, it's just a middle to to an end which would be the film um so i started taking classes at ucla study with uh professor richard walters who's who's uh well he was the head of screenwriting at ucla um and um uh from there you 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 have to you work on 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 screenplays so there had been like probably two, two or three um, out there that are horror screenplays and, and uh, uh, comedy horror. Uh, uh, I was really inspired by Tremors. I just loved, when we're talking about inspirations, yeah. Tremors was my, my, I'm like, oh man, I, I love that movie. So I studied the heck out of it. And I, and I wrote a screenplay about a small town being overrun by killer uh, front lawn grass. Cause I thought, how ridiculous is is, can, is this? I, this has to be. But, like, a friend of mine was telling me a story about how he was in the fields in, in, in Ohio and they were like sod fields. He said uh -huh. the scary thing was walking at night in a sod field. I'm like, a sod field? Really? So from there, it, it, it was like, oh, this this maybe this is a this is a the, a seed of a story. Um so but under the commentary was probably uh, the third or fourth uh, screenplay out there, but it was, and back then I think we we're calling it the calf, the caterpillar, and, and the curandera, which is very to me kind of like the white, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. It kind of it took from that, but but it it, it evolved, it changed. Um, so, but it's still a blueprint. It's not the final product, but a book is a final product. So that step we got, we needed uh, the artist involved, and that was. Because uh, comics are a collaborative medium, unless you get if people like yourselves that can do it all. But I, I can't, I can't do it all. So I needed Margaret to to finish it for us. Yeah, yeah and you I really. Think, oh God. I was just say. I mean, you. I, I'm surprised you found her on Craigslist. I mean, that's. I mean, the work's incredible. That that it, it's it's great that you you managed to find her that way. It, it's crazy how that worked out. It's it, it's one of those things where it was it was meant to be because she just come to town from. St. Louis. 
She didn't have a regular job yet. She answers an ad in Craigslist. Um, and we, and, and people told me like, uh, you, you may find someone in, in South America that's going to be able to do it for a low budget price because, you know, I'm, I'm just a bartender. I don't have a, a, a large budget. I'm not DC or Marvel. So, um, uh, but I, I said, the thing I don't like about having to find someone remotely in another country is, uh, it, it's, it's, you have to sit there on the zoom and you have to sometimes language barriers. I'm like, I want to be able to sit down and really get involved in this panel with her, uh, with the person. And, and she answered the ad and it was, she lived in a, like 10 minutes away. So we'd meet wow. everyone at Starbucks and we'd sit there That's and cool. I feel it was meant to be because so she, she, we finished the, 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 uh, uh, the book and it was right before COVID. Um, and she, for her time in LA, it was all working on the book. And then she's actually living in St. Louis again. Uh, and now that she moved back home. So it was, it was like her time in LA was working on, on, on one graphic novel. It was her first book. It was my first book. Um, so it, I think it was meant to be that we found her. It wouldn't have been any, any other, the story would have been different if it wasn't for her, I think. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's beautiful artwork too. Um, so, okay. Um, let's start digging into inspirations because i think i think that's a a fun one um what kind of inspirations initially drew you to reading and or or consuming media like what what kind of made you fall in love with storytelling to the because you have to love storytelling to right. want to do storytelling yeah, yeah. so what do you, what you know uh, what's your journey been for that? Like, what are some of your earliest inspirations? Uh, um, for sure, when I was a kid, uh, it was a communal experience watching Twilight Zone. It was, it was, uh, uh, I'm, the, I'm, yes. I'm the youngest of, of, of nine kids. So there's six boys and three girls. And we have a large yard to play in. But at night, we, we turn on the TV. And, and in Albuquerque, we had the Creepy Creature Feature Show at like it was like after the news and it was like a an, a b movie horror movie uh it was, it was like a slasher and we sit there and watch it and then right after that there'd either be an episode of twilight zone or an episode of star trek so it was it was it was the um i i think twilight zone really was it's storytelling it's just pure storytelling rod sterling really um he was he's making parables of of what was going on in that time and and I think that's probably definitely one of the first uh, inspirations. And then later on, uh, uh, books, Ray Bradbury's books. Um, but also, I was the kid in the library. Uh, I wasn't, if, if if someone told me, read this this book, and it's this thick, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm going to kind of push back. But I gravitate, the comic books, I could consume them easier. And I wasn't the um, the most studious. So the, the books, the comic books, and the um, I really got into epic. You remember epic and heavy metal, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and um, as well as uh, um, all the the Conan uh, uh, comic books as well. Th those are my go to. And from then it was it was like it, I, so. I, yeah, I think those were the impetus of my wanting to tell stories. Is I want to tell a story, cool story like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's funny. Um, Twilight Zone is such a like an interesting show because like looking back at it um anytime i rewatch them i'm always amazed by like the credits of the writers who were writing for that show i mean you had william faulkner um yeah. writing you know tv episodes it's insane <laughs> it's um but it's but it's such solid writing in in the sense of having like a really clear beginning middle and end a clear motif and theme and like um just very thoughtful thought-provoking stories you know Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we, we probably all were watching those when we were kids, right? Twilight Zone? Yep. yep. For sure. And I think that uh, it, it's funny you mentioned that because that is definitely one of those ones that stood out. Like there was a lot of other stuff at that time that I was consuming, but that's really stood out for its storytelling mm -hmm. because there were always those like twists where out of nowhere, you're like, wow, you get this like really big payoff like I, I guess that would be it it like yeah. pays off really well yeah. all the threads tie you know and for me as well it was a to look at things differently you know it, it it's it's not always what it is the, the classic uh the christmas episode where 
All the dolls are in the uh, trash, not the trash can, but the um. Don't give uh, it away. <laughs> Just yeah. Toy gotta, spoiler alert, you guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I ho hopefully everyone has seen that. It's such yeah, a classic, classic Twilight Zone. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's 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 like in a way it's it, you it uh you, you can look at things differently and than 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 what they're what they what they seem. You know. Yeah, yeah, and and um, it's it it was interesting that we were talking about Bradbury at the con too because that was a a real early interest of mine. I used to read all of his short stories and books and stuff like that um, when I was a kid and um bradbury was like a massive influence in the sense of just crafting a story really drawing you into a theme and um and i think i'm i might be crazy but i think bradbury might have written some of the twilight zone episodes too which is kind of nuts pretty sure yeah yeah um but yeah that that's uh that's a really that's a really fascinating list scott what were some of your earliest inspirations that drew you to like well yeah writing? i can I, I definitely can um relate to what paul was saying um as far as not being the most studious like i struggled i've talked about this before but i str i struggled in school and everything and and def and in reading and i you know had some have some reading disabilities and things like that or so um so i did i discovered comics and everything and and that was you know that was kind of my entry point into reading later i would read like I, I, I'd at least start reading like stuff like Stephen King and stuff like that. And, but I, I could never just because of uh, just the main, my mind works. I, I just could not finish a book. I mean, I would just, I, I, I'd be like, I'd be like five pages into something. I'm like, what did I just read? And then I have yeah. to go back. And so, so I kind of struggle with that, but you know, it was a lot of movie, but I like to write. That was the weird thing. I'd like to write, but it was all based on, a lot of it was based on, like I said, either comics or what I had read or just movies like, OK, I can see how this is playing out. How would I put that into words? So I, I, I sometimes I wonder the way I write, if it's if it maybe it's more I, I don't know where I picked up a lot of that stuff. I mean, later, you know, later I started listening to it, like books on tapes, tape and tapes and stuff like that when those first kind of came out and then I consumed a lot more yeah. you know at least listened to a lot more books and things like that um but uh but yeah so so for me you know comics and just i guess whatever kind of media i could i could dive into and there's there you know there are certain stories like a lot of i, I could read like a lot of stephen king like the short stories and stuff because mm -hmm. i could get through those so i'd read i'd read those and um I remember my dad always, you know, he would always give me the the collections because he didn't like he liked Stephen King, but he didn't like the short stories. Uh, there, he wanted more to him, so he, you know, so so I I would read those and stuff, and so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm influenced by a lot of things as far as I, I'm a big fan of I, I'm a big fan of horror, but but to me, like only maybe 15% of the horror that I've seen, I actually like. So really good horror that stuff that resonates with me. Um, and then I also love, you know, like the Steven Spielberg stuff from back mm -hmm. in the day, like, like I talk about Goonies and stuff where, where kind of kids were the protagonists. That's, that's kind of what inspired me to do the comic book I'm working on now. So it's kind of that combined with some horror elements and things like that, but still pretty much I, I would consider all ages. I mean, if Goonies all, is all ages, then this, my book definitely is all ages as well. So, you know, I like it. Yeah. So, it's, you know, I, I, a lot of it's comics and stuff. <laughs> it's funny with comics. I think I, I have the, the same experience because, because I, I I'm gonna guess I, I I was not diagnosed with ADD, but I'm pretty sure I I I, I, I was that was me as a kid. I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It seems like you know back in the '80s, maybe they didn't like. They're like, no, nah, he's just he's just dumb. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was diagnosed with ADHD at an early oh, age, but okay. and I I still you know I, I I took tests for like dyslexia, but I never they they said I wasn't, but. A lot of the things I hear dyslexics talk about, I'm like, yeah, that happens to me too. Yeah, so I'm I'm thinking that. Yeah. 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 And luckily you have a perfect name if you are dyslexic, Scott. <laughs> you're not gonna mix up Scott yeah. and certain two S's. Um 
Uh, Corey, what about you? Like, what were some of your like earliest inspirations? Oh, by the way, also the whole thing about the eighties and not diagnosing it's, it is interesting. I do wonder, I often get really curious about artists potentially having like, you know, um, all sorts of like autism spectrum disorders and stuff like that from our generation who wouldn't be diagnosed or even be aware of it just because back in our childhood times, it was just like, well, that's the weird kid, (laughs) you know, like, (laughs) yeah. Uh, this is Paul uh, reading comic books. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Could be. Um, so Corey, what do you think about like inspirations? Like what were, what were some of your earliest inspirations to write or like, you know, in the sense of stuff you consumed that made you want to participate in storytelling? Yeah. So probably earliest would be like Dr. Seuss. I think that has, I think, I think Dr. Seuss and uh, Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Both of those, kind of have a combination of like weirdness and uh the second one just is it fascinated me because there was no color it was all inks um and the story wasn't a happy story like all this crappy stuff happened and then it just ended and, and he was like well sometimes sometimes days are like that and i always thought oh yeah it's like really relatable and then later on i read a lot of like a lot of spy novels and stuff you know robert ludlum and <clears throat> you know, a lot of those types of uh, kind of espionage, uh, deep state type things back before that was, uh, you know, <laughs> before that was a thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I liked I liked basic TV and stuff. I watched a lot of Comedy Central, like a lot of stand up comedy. I was into, into a lot of that stuff. And and so it's kind of kind of all over the place. Um, my family on my dad's side um there's a lot of teachers on that side and so pretty heavy shakespeare influence Mm. um so there's quite a bit of you know conversations of whether you know macbeth is uh you know a a more interesting series of characters than you know uh hamlet or whatever that was like common dinner table fare Corey, Uh, there's an actor in the room you can't say the name of the play (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so that was kind of, so, I, I, I'm a you know, the, 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 point, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a lot of that was just kind of the, you know, surrounded by that type of thing. Um, it was kind of interesting. So, but th- that's interesting with, uh, with the, all the teachers, did you, did you start writing back then and, and expose your writing to uh, teachers? Your your family? Um or no. I was I was uh I'm not I'm a terrible writer, actually. So I I um I write begrudgingly uh so that I have something to draw, I think. But I was published at an early age, if you call it published. I had a a poem about uh my brother's death that I wrote when I was uh-huh. young that uh that got into a thing and then um I freaked some people out years later writing about the funeral (laughs) and, and I remember being pulled out of class. Are you okay? It's like, yeah, just had a little flashback. I thought I'd write it down. Um, And then uh, I wouldn't, I I wouldn't say that writing is a really big thing that drives what I do. I think audio, I I think I'm an audio kinesthetic when it comes to like a learning style. Hmm. And so I will often discover things or make connections as I'm saying them out loud. And so even, even today I would rather make a video essay explaining the concept than I would uh, write a blog post. And so mm. um, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a speaker than I am a writer. Okay. Okay. I, I can kind of relate to the teacher thing too, because I I've told this story a few times before, but it's like, uh, I kind of got into comics backwards. Like a lot of people get into comics as a gateway into literature. And for me, it's like my mom was an English teacher and my dad was a graphic designer. And so, um, when I was growing up, like I was constantly being fed books like <laughs> and if I didn't like a book, my mom would just find other types of books. Um, which I, I always feel um, personally as a, as a fan of books and reading, I think that's really important. Like for, I, I, I have, I've had a lot of friends in my life who didn't consider themselves readers 
and then I found them a book that was like their genre and what they're into. Uh, like I remember having a friend in high school who was like, all he read was Stephen King novels and he hated reading. And I was like, well, maybe you just don't like Stephen King. Like, mm -hmm. and I remember being like, here, you should read Jack Kerouac. And then like, suddenly the guy like now, you know, 30 years later or whatever, he's, he reads more than I do, you know? Um, but anyhow, so I, I was reading a bunch of books and really into reading, especially fantasy. I got like heavy Roald Dahl for like children's stories was like one of the first I really connected with and just got everything written by him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but like I was reading books and then I remember going to a library and uh, being handed a free comic book that's supposed to get kids into reading. And it did the reverse for me where I was like, wait a minute, this is like art. And, you know, cause I was familiar with like Sunday comics and stuff, but the comic book itself, I remember that like, I it was almost like the next day that I was going to like spinner racks and picking up comics. Um, and it was called Spider-Man adventures in reading. I still remember, uh, but, but it's like, uh, I remember just thinking about the potential of it. Cause it's like, Oh, it's like, it's words and pictures. And like, I think because, my dad was a visual artist and my mom was like an English teacher. It's like, like e English and art just kind of makes sense. Like to me, it always has. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an, it's an interesting thing. Like seeing that, um, that connection of like how people get into comics, whether comics got them into books or books got them into comics. Um, for me, it was like the totally the reverse. I, I, yeah, it, for the, the comics was, it, like like Scott, it was easy for me to to digest. Yeah, it's a language. It's a language that I think connects. Mm -hmm. I, I think when you experience comics, like I I mean I know there's some people who can kind of learn how to get into comics, but I tend to think there's like a mind for it that it just you know it it just kind of makes sense. Yeah, I can see that. So comics kind of get you like so that's in like the back pocket like of inspiration like you got comics you've got um you know twilight zone you've got these structured stories and stuff like that um and then like when you went from a script to writing a comic um it almost feels like coming full circle to like the comics that yeah yeah it, 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 and, and i realized at one point uh, um um, I, I, I have a little essay that I, that I'd written in the eighth grade, I believe. And I bring it out every once in a while. And it, it's basically, I'll just fast forward through it. But it was, it was, it was like, you know, when you're, you're turning in these journals for, uh, uh in, in fifth and eighth grade writing classes, and I, was, and I was sitting there saying like, comic books are fun. <laughs> you can adventure into a foreign land. You can, uh, fly through the air and also their investments for the future. And I'm like, and I look at this now. I'm like, I wrote that. That's so random and weird. But, but I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's like, it's like it's come full circle. You know, I started off uh, loving comic books, uh, and then I got into theater and performing and and acting, and then writing. And then I realized, well, you know, you can write a million screenplays, but it's it's the Hollywood game is pretty hard to get them made, right? But that led me into the graphic novel world, and. Um, if I live in the graphic novel world forever, I'm I'm happy with it. It's it's a very fulfilling. I mean, just running into you at the LA Comic Con was was cool because you're talking to fellow creatives. Um, uh, for instance, did, did we talk about the Ray Bradbury story? Oh no, tell it. Yeah, because we're sitting there and, and and I was telling you how we, my fiance and I, happen to be in downtown LA and we. W we were walking around the library and, and I asked the librarian, do you have under the cottonwood tree here? And she goes around the corner like, yeah, it's right here. I was like, oh, this is so cool. My book is in the same uh, room that yeah. where, where Ray Bradbury would sit there and write out uh, his stories. I'm like, this is awesome. And I'm telling you this story. And then and then you say, oh, yeah, I saw him at, at, a, at, a, at a theater in Silver Lake uh, back in the 90s, I believe. Right. And maybe. Yeah. But, um, and I go, I was there. I <laughs> saw that same play. And it was when he, he went to Ireland and he wrote a bunch of, uh, um, Irish, uh, little short stories and he turned those into a play and he, and, and yet, uh, this, the 
I don't know what the name of the theater was, but it was literally right around the corner. And so yeah. They say. So you and I were at the same at the same room at one time, maybe at the same night. I don't know. But we both have his signature, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought that was funny because it's like I remember really vividly the, the main. I mean, of course, I want to see Bradbury's stories. But the, uh, the main reason I went was I heard he went to him. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, I'm going to go to this to meet Ray Bradbury. Like, and, and, and they were excellent plays. Um, it was like a small troupe. I wish I could remember yeah. the name of the group that like partnered with him on him. But, um, but yeah, it was funny. And then we had these Ray Bradbury stories to kind of exchange, which I think is um, another fun thing about like kind of the, the creative world where, um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think you had had a quote too that you quoted at a um, panel. That you yeah, so, so every once in a while we do these panels, and and uh, the panelists will ask like, "Do you have anything inspiring?" Because uh, a lot of times, because since it's a children's or you know all ages grabber novel, uh, though I'll be in a room full of full of younger kids, and they'll ask me like, "Do you have anything to tell to the young kids?" And I'll be like. Well, you know, I, 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 I love a Ray Bradbury quote because he was asked kind of the same question. What any inspiring room uh, words? And he said, um, if you write a journal every day for 365 days, there's got to be one day where you are a good storyteller. So definitely just write a story every day. Something good will come out of it. So I, I based and I do say that I got that from Ray and I I'm like and I'm telling you guys it. And so it's like. You know, it, it it please get inspired by him. You know, read his books. So, yeah, that's that's funny. I I definitely I, I I like telling that story whenever I can to the kids. That's awesome. And speaking of kids and and kind of doing things formatted for kids and stuff. Um, so we're we're at the con. I think it was like day two where I'm like, well, I gotta pick up, <laughs> I gotta pick up Paul's book before I before the the time's over because um particularly because my son like would dig the hell out of it too. Um, and so I asked you to like sign it to my kid mm. and you have a really kind of cool way of customizing your books to make it a special experience for the kids that read them. So I kind of was wondering if you could e explain, uh, get into like the leaf, sure. the, the custom sure. cutout leaves yeah. that you hand out and then the stamps. Cause I think also we have a lot of creatives and, and creators who watch our show and stuff and like, both are really good ideas too. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, yes, please. Someone steal this idea. I, I, uh, my fiance and I went to a, a stamp. No, it was a, uh, um, somewhere in LA, there is a print museum and we, it was an open house type of a day where they had people telling or explaining how to use this old fashioned press or, or there, there's one person that was carving out, and and making and then and then you can make your own uh, prints. So that inspired me. I went online and I figured out like, oh, where do you get this? It's a little piece of rubber, is what it is, and you carve it out. So I wrote something on the rubber, little piece of block of rubber, and then I carved it out because what was happening when when someone would ask like, hey, can you sign this? And you always try to have something inspirational and like, oh, okay, I'm sitting there and I, I try to squiggle out something and, and sometimes it's just um keep writing or odole or you know like like and it doesn't come out that well but i figured let me just have something prepared um so now and i got to do this uh for your son but i also get there's i don't know if you remember there's a two sisters that came up yeah they're really young so i'm like all right i get my little routine going okay so i'm like oh so the mother says oh can you sign this for him i'm like so sure sure so what's your names and, and then so i write their names down okay so i just want to tell you something this is a golden cottonwood leaf and it's magical if you believe it's magical if you don't it's also a bookmark but it's <laughs> so, and they hopefully get a laugh on that and they go and then i say um uh well you know this leaf is the magic of the forest and then and then i say and then i get the stamp and i slap slap it on and it, and it says and it says what does this say and the little girls read it use the magic that you carry within you know yeah and where do you carry that magic i know this is so totally gimmicky but it's it works for the yeah you know, um and where do you carry that magic and like ah in your heart and like you're right and i have another little stamp where i put in a little image of a heart so and I give it to them and, and, and they, they get pretty 
get pretty uh, uh like oh this is cool like oh that's great and, and yeah it's, it's fun yeah and i witnessed that at the con like there were a lot of people like a lot of kids um you made their day like by doing that little extra bit with the book because they were already going to get the book but it's like i think going that extra mile just really it was fun to watch them react a little personalization hopefully yeah yeah for sure so anybody out there please uh, get in get into making your own stamps it's just kind of fun it's like a little just don't don't steal that line like i don't want everybody at cons to suddenly (laughs) be doing like the magic is within you (laughs) (laughs) but yeah that's a great idea um i i love that it uh they're custom cut out um leafs as well and so it like really makes for um a much more interesting kind of giveaway along with the book too which i think is really cool yeah yeah and and the parents they they, you can definitely see when they're like ah this made my child's day or they 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 can really they, they they like it they enjoy it yeah so um so speaking about that like moment where your stuff is at a Bradbury, a library with Bradbury, yeah. um, is there something like because of the fact that like you've done different iterations of the story and then you finally have this like completed graphic novel, is there something about like a completed book that's out there in the world or like actually at a library? Um, what has that experience been like, you know? It definitely it's, it's it's definitely fulfilling uh um in, in, in i'm thinking back at a time where uh when i was a kid it was where the red fern grows that was one of our class reading assignments and i remember thinking like uh, okay that is a cute little story but it's not really my culture it's not really a, a chicano uh, story so um thankfully the book now is in libraries and it's great to see and it's actually being taught in some of the school systems uh and and we'll do little uh, zoom meetings uh, zoom meetups with the kids and i realized oh my new mexican story is being talked or, or being taught in some of the schools and so it's like like um i don't, I don't want to say i'm replacing where the red fern glow grows but maybe it's something that is unique to that culture that is able to be talked about, which is, which is, I think cool. So um, I think it's, 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 it's fun. It's awesome to be able to see it in, in libraries. Um, And it's, it's, it's an independent book. It's not, I don't have a publisher behind me. It's just myself. So. Yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's um, been indie from the ground up. And I think that um, the amount of outreach you've been able to get for it, which is really cool and impressive as well. And you guys should all check out, um, Paul's website it's it's down there there's also a documentary that Paul made um, that we have a link to as well just as a treat for you guys um, it's down there I encourage you guys to watch it, 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 it any any any, any uh, youngster these days knows about creating fame on YouTube or TikTok but 1977 how did you create a little bit of a buzz about yourself and and, and if you had talent or you didn't have talent what did you do? Well, you went on the gong show. And that's what the documentary is about, is going on the gong show. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. And it's it's kind of, I actually, Scott, um, in particular, I think you would dig the hell out of it. It's, oh, I would it's, just check that out. I forgot yeah. about the gong show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it was, uh, there, there's a lot of craft involved in it, too, um, like kind of awesome costumes and stuff. So Building your own costumes. Yeah, it, it's it's bef- before you could just get on YouTube, you you had to travel miles away to get on the Gong Show and, and do your little skit. And that's yeah, or if you had a, like a special talent, you could maybe get on That's Incredible or Real oh, People or something like that. <laughs> I remember those. Yeah, yeah. What was their tagline? That's incredible. And the audience. Yeah. yeah. Has, yeah. Oh my gosh, I remember that. Oh, man. Or the days. Um. So. Okay, so the the unique thing like about graphic novels is like um, like if you were pitching this as a film, right? You'd need a whole crew. Right. Um, the small mm-hmm. amount of people you need to collaborate on this kind of thing um, it is pretty pretty incredible because you can take something from like start to finish. But doing graphic novels takes a long time. Out of curiosity, uh, how long was it for you from like start of scripts um, for for the book adaptation 
to the final um, graphic novel and then like what did you kind of learn about the process of making comics along uh, the way? Uh, um, the process of making comics is get a great collaborator like Margaret. Um, and, and then of course my brother, uh, it's second nature for us to work together. But if you have a, a great relationship with your artist, um, it's, it, that speaks volumes. Um, but the screenplay itself was, uh, there, there's three times a, a movie is made is once when it's the screen, when it's, once yeah. when it's written a second time when it's actually filmed. And then the third time was edited, right? So it's the same thing with with a with a with the graphic novel. Um, so we have the the the, the panels roughed out um, uh, from the the comic pages to the pan to the rough panels, and then Margaret and I would sit down and we uh, maybe adjust from there. Um, so, but in, in the very end, there are still some changes that could happen, and we. Thankfully, Margaret caught something right before I went to printers and she's she quickly adjusted it and, and actually and we had to change some lines, too. So it's it's right up until the printers that's done. Um, but but as far as the time goes, since this is in, in the indie world, it Margaret had her day job. And so this was on the weekends uh, that she would be able to get to it. And then um, sometimes sometimes she couldn't get to the weekends and maybe she's traveling or I remember there's a couple months that was out because she broke her wrist. So I was like, all right, there's nothing, there's no, there's no illustrating getting it done at that time. Um, so if you're in the, the, the DC or the Marvel world, you are able to get one artist to do the, um, uh, roughs and another one artist to do pencils and another artist to inks. Um, but of course you guys know that it's, it's in the indie world. Sometimes it's just a one-stop shop. So it took, uh, I want to say about eight, eight years. So it was, it was one of those things where we have to have the passion and the love for it. Yeah. Out there because we're not waiting eight years if, if we don't enjoy it and we don't both uh, like it and we don't both accomplish something that we can talk about later on. And I think we both, uh, uh, eight, it was a worthy eight years um, because in, in any world, it's just a man. That's just how it is. You know, we can't push it any faster when it comes to getting good work out there. If, of course, if, if, if I was able, she was able to pay her bills on what I could give her at that time, then it would be a different story, but I can't, I didn't. Yeah. And I think that, um, the amount of time it took, it definitely shows like when you see the work, it's like, it's not like rushed sloppy work. It's beautifully illustrated and, and really well written. And, um, and that can take a long time. I always describe us working on comics as it, it's kind of this weird experience. It's like, it, because we're usually a fan of our own story as well. Right. And so you're kind of experiencing um, the creation of your story in slow motion. And so it, it's kind of like if you took a TV show you really liked or a movie you really liked and you only get to watch like maybe a second a day, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of the pace of comics. Um, but that's an incredible thing that you guys stuck with it, um, for that long and also had a team that was willing to kind of be on board for like the, the, that time as well. Cause with collaboration, that's always a worry too. Like what, what happens if the artist drops out like four years in, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it happens for sure. Um, yeah. They move out of the country or, or, or they just lose interest, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, also breaking your wrist that's that's like the nightmare scenario for all yeah. of us <laughs> yeah. when your wrist is your money maker that's a, yeah. that's a problem <laughs> exactly it's like you gotta get your wrists insured you know like like you know like the actresses back in the 1940s who was the actress that had to get her her, her legs were insured oh that's that's, that's right i, I, I can't know, remember one like that yeah there's that zoolander was it zoolander where the guy keeps his hands the hand model oh, yeah, keeps his hands yeah. in like a container. Yeah, the David Duchovny character in that. Yeah, and I kind of feel model. like we yeah. should all do that. We should all get those like cryogenic. Like we need Bacta tanks for our hands. Rest, rest your wrist in a certain position at night so it doesn't strain it. Exactly. Um. So, so Paul, um, you're working on. Uh, well, for, first, um, I, we we mentioned the pitch at the beginning. I I really do think people need to pick up this book. So. 
why don't we run through one more time what this is about and then maybe talk about um, the other projects you're you're brewing as okay. well. Sure. So uh, real quick, um, for those who may have just tuned in towards the end, under the cottonwood tree, um, why don't we give like a kind of synopsis of, of what the story is about again? Sure. Uh, um, uh, so under the cottonwood tree is about um, two brothers uh, and it's it's the family dynamics and one brother is is never happy with how the other brother is acting and eventually all of a sudden he's turned into a little calf by the local kudendera and a kudendera is a healer of the village but the children of the village think that she is a witch but she's not but why is she turning uh, little carlos into a little calf so the children have have an adventure that day and the older brother Amadeo eventually um, comes to learn that he actually loves his little brother Carlos even though he's he's uh, a pain in the butt um, and the children have an adventure the whole day and in the end the Kudendera actually is healed by the children because she is suffering from a susto so a susto is something that means a your soul is off balance so that's why she's acting this way. And the kids don't realize that. And in fact, she doesn't realize that, but eventually they help her to heal herself. Um, and in the end, they find out what is important and that is family. But they have to have an adventure that day and they come across a giant Native American uh, creature called a Chiguelo. So my maternal great-grandmother was Apache. So I always, always have to reference a, a Native American culture. So we came up with a Chiguelo who's like a, a giant lava uh, boogeyman made of, of, of rock. Um, so the kids will have fun. Um, it'll be like, a, hopefully they'll get like a never ending story type feel from it uh, and, or Wizard of Oz. Um, and, and, uh, and as far as um, uh, what I'm working on now, we we're gonna be a part of an anthology that is um, part of OSU, Ohio State University Press, which is run by, well, the press is called Latino Graphics or Lat Latinx Graphics. Nice with uh, Professor Aldama um, runs that. So we've asked, we've been asked to contribute to an anthology all about uh, Latino Latinx food and sports. Uh, so, so I got to talk about my, my New Mexican uh, empanadas and my fiance got to talk about her Salvadorian pupusas and she illustrated it. Um, uh, oh, somebody's heard of Susto before. Oh, cool. Um, um, uh, so that's what we're working on now and, uh, it's done, but, uh, or it's submitted. We, we, let's, let's see how I'm how glad you got it submitted. Cause it, it, it seemed like you guys were actually kind of up against a deadline during yeah. LA comic con too, yeah. which is, I actually had to, to, uh, email the professor and say like, uh, can we get a few more days? Because, you know, when you're preparing for con, you've got to, uh, you know, make sure you've got all your, 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 your stickers or, or your stamps or what have you. Um, so he was kind enough to give us over the weekend. So we submitted like Monday night, like, like at 1030 at night. Um, so that's done. So thankfully. Um, and so, and we're, we're, we're coming up with ideas to try to pitch to, uh, I really want to tell my fiance's story, how she came from El Salvador when she was yeah. two years old, uh, to the country. And I'm like, Oh, that it just, it, her story writes itself. And, and we will have her illustrate because um, um, I don't have to pair. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I joke, but uh, um, uh, no, it's, it's a passion project for both of us. So, and, and hopefully, you know, with that, we can get it out to press at some time. Yeah. And those are great collaborations too, because then you can just do co-creator kind of sure. deals. And I, I think when you're in a collaboration like that, that's, that's like the ultimate thing anyway, because then you're equally vested in the success of the book. And um, but uh, it's, it's, it's not, it, she'll, I, I think she'll be happy to, to, to work on it. I don't think she'll, she'll be tortured. Really. All right. This is, I'm, I'm, when am I going to see some money now? It's it's a passion, like you said. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. That's that that sounds really cool. Um, having met you both too, I, I think you guys will collaborate well. Um, and also, uh, equally, like this is a just testament to like the fun of doing conventions. Um, you guys have similar music taste too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, well, we, uh, we were talking about concerts and seeing like like oh, you've 
because uh, uh, we we saw X not too long ago, and like that's a great LA punk band that you know it's 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 uh, luckily enough it's like we that's we get to go and and work on comics together and then and then see a good good show you know yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the ideal. So, um, I I guess um, real quick, uh, uh, there there's another idea you were talking about, and I don't know if you want to talk about it on stream, but I will say, follow Paul and what he's doing because he has a lot of good stories in the works. Um, it's it's it sounds pretty pretty interesting. Um, one about I think New Mexico again. Um, that, oh, that sounded really fascinating as well. Uh, there's there's been a few. Uh, Granuda is one of them, but like a superhero. Uh, um, uh, I'm not sure which because I, I there's I think, one about a shootout, but I don't know if we want to. Oh talk oh, about oh oh yes, for sure. I want to get the story out there about uh, um, um, uh, Al Fuego Baca. So Al Fuego Baca. Everybody knows who Billy the Kid was, but not a lot of people know who Alfoyka Baca was. And he was he was a, a real life uh, character who was one New Mexican against 80 Texans and 8,000 bullets, they said. But they and it was 32 hours. It was a, it was a shootout. And I'm like, oh, I got to get that story out there. Um, and Disney did do a. Uh, a, a TV version of it called the nine lives of a Fuego Baca, but it, it's not, I mean, no, this, this needs to be a, its own uh, 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 story out there, which, which I'm, I'm hoping to get it out there. That's awesome. I, so, so I'm, I'm excited to kind of see the, the future stories. And I will say um, this is a really great accomplishment. This under the cottonwood tree, it's a beautiful book, um, you know, coming from a cartoonist too. I, I think most of us but, will look at the art and, and it's, it's incredible. Um, so I, and, and the pacing and the storytelling is really fun. So I think people should pick it up. It means a lot coming from a, a talent like yourself. That was, oh. uh, uh, yeah. When, when er, Irma and I were, were sitting, my fiance, were sitting there looking at your book. You're like, Oh my God. God, how many, this is, this is art. This is, this is, this is a labor of love right there with your illustrations. It's pretty incredible. Well, well, thank you. Um, but, uh, but I, I, I think this is, this is a really, really great book. Um, so, uh, so overall, uh, I guess to kind of get close to, to wrapping, um, before we go, uh, why don't we touch a little bit on impressions of LA Comic Con? Unless Scott and Corey, did you have anything you wanted to add before we kind of get into LA Comic Con in general? No, no, I'm, I've I've just been enjoying the conversation, but I I I am kind of curious how, how the con went, Corey. Nice. Yeah, same. Okay, so LA Comic Con um, overall, uh, why don't we get into like your impression of how the show went for you and like. Uh, like in general, like what what your impressions were of it? Uh, besides the um, the little bit of a of a of a odd start <laughs> because we couldn't find where we were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, really well attended. Um, I think I you know after COVID, it's it's people are out there and and um, they want to spend time at the booths and sit there and 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 read or purchase at the time or just or a lot of, a lot of people were walk, walking away with the postcards and actually uh purchased them on uh the pdfs of them that i uh, that i also that you can also get on the website um so well attended um i did not i was not able to attend any of the uh panels that i know were going on yeah um i know you know i'm a big star trek nerd and i know william shatner was there but i i didn't I, it's like i i I want to sit there and talk to people and, and I, we can get in some good conversations uh, about, you know, culture in New Mexico or, or I, one guy actually was, got a little political with us and, and I don't know where he was coming from. But, yeah. I was curious about that guy. Uh, I overheard a bit of that cause he was, yeah. a, he was there for a while. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and it's almost like he was trying to goad me into to an argument and I'm like, I, don't feel like arguing, but I'm enjoying this conversation, but I don't know. And he was trying to get political a few, few times. And I'm like, what, what are you doing here at the con? So, um, uh, great, uh, um, attendance, uh, uh, really great conversations. I love to be able to see the kids there as well. And, and yeah. with the parents, um, cosplaying, I 
seemed to be a little bit less than than usual, maybe because it was cold and a little bit rainy outside. Yeah, uh, we were right near the, uh, the 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 open doors with the food trucks. Um, so that was easy access to some good food. Um, I had a great experience. Um, yeah. Josh, what do you think? Yeah, um, for me, it was good. It wasn't as good as my last time at LA Comic Con for sales, just in general for raw sales. But um, but it was it was a good experience. Um, cons are a unique experience in general, but because of the there was a lot of traffic mm. uh, coming by our booths, and so I think because of that variety of people. Um, it, it, it did make for a really valuable experience. Um, there were definitely, uh, this is the other side of cons that a lot of people don't realize, um, that Paul, obviously you've done a few, so it's like quite a few. So it's like, you're familiar with this, but people out there who haven't done cons or maybe are just doing cons specifically for sales. Um, you know, there's a lot of people coming by who are like buyers. I think there was one for Sony pictures who stopped mm -hmm. by my booth. And so it's like people who are actually looking to license IPs and stuff like that. You get access to things like that at a con that, you know, you don't always get access to outside of it. Um, and then also, like, honestly, uh, meeting you, Paul, and our other neighbors um, yeah. uh, um, who a, had a did a story, right? Yeah, obituary, the yeah. ghost story in the short uh, animation. Um, and I might try to have them on the show at some point. But um yeah, they were on your other side, so I didn't. I didn't. It, it's like I'm, I'm. The people are here. The people there. People there. But yeah, I, I needed. I should have. I'll, I'll Google them and I'll, I'll find it, or I'll, I'll see them on here maybe. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, but it, but it was a overall, it was a good experience. Um, the location we were at, like, like Paul said, it's it was right by the food trucks. So again, we got like hit by like so much cross traffic. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. because you had flows of people pretty consistently, and much like Paul was saying. Um, I didn't get to experience the con itself outside of just my direct neighbors. And then of course, like, you know, uh, bumping into like Lonnie and, um, Lonnie Millsap, who's been on the show was there. Um, uh, um, Hav was there and yeah. we've had him on the show. I think we had him on like right before. So, um, it, it was fun for like seeing people. Um, oh, and then, uh, we had a good friend of the show, um jimmy who had stopped by the first time i was at la comic-con um he he uh is a listener of the show and he stopped by and i believe he picked up paul's book as well oh, okay. um right. and i know i know for a fact he did pick up javier's book as well at that con so shout out to jimmy who stopped by who's a, a listener of the show um uh, and oh go ahead can i talk about uh, something we, we we predicted but accidentally predicted so oh yeah yeah that's hilarious <laughs> so for con wrap-ups this i i this might get the award for one of the most genius things i've seen done at a comic-con yeah. okay paul tell the story so josh and i are sitting there and we look over to an empty area of uh, that so sometimes at, at conventions uh, there, somebody doesn't show up maybe a sickness or maybe they just couldn't make the airplane uh, so there's empty boots so in front of us, there were like three or four empty booths. And and I was telling Josh, I'm like, why? You know, somebody should just show up and just plant yeah. them there and just take it over. And we're, and, and then literally 10 seconds after that, there is – it turns out he's an illustrator for Venom, correct? So I don't know yeah, his yeah. name. Uh, but what he does is he takes over the four empty booths, positions it, so that people are, are able to get access to him easier. Yeah. And he m moves the wall that was there partitioning it and moves it behind. And then, so he has like, like, like a full booth space yeah. as opposed to like an artist <laughs> alley table. Yeah. He just took the whole corner and it's like, it's a key corner. Cause it's the totally. first thing you see when you walk in from the food trucks. Yeah. So the guy, the guy has gone from like regular traffic to like just massive lines for the yeah. rest was of the it? con. Was it Ryan Stegman? Uh, that doesn't sound familiar. Other guy, Della De La Rosa. De La Rosa sound found sound familiar? Yeah, that does. Yeah, uh, De La Rosa. Yeah, yeah, an older gentleman. Yeah, um, Sam De La Rosa. That's it. Yeah. So but I mean, he was it. he had a following outside oh, of that. You know, he's well, a Marvel he guy. It, it, it was it was a it was a trip. How it, it was like where from where he he had four times the amount of space 
and all of a sudden four times the amount of people oh show yeah up, and they're yeah. just waiting and waiting and i was like good yeah. for him he just he just made his own booth area <laughs> yeah that was an amazing um thing i i had a a couple funny experiences where um one of the guys who bought my book writes for like um oh now i'm blanking out on the he had done a panel he wrote for like a giant wow. animation uh um dang it. who was that you you you, now I'm you get out. Right into people uh in the food court uh, yeah um, oh and then i because i vape because i i'm an ex-smoker and that keeps me from smoking um i i'd go outside for a smoke or whatever and then i'd run into like i ran into like the i ended up sharing a cigarette with the well not a cigarette but like being on a smoke break <laughs> with um like the co-creator of like uh witchblade <laughs> yeah yeah and and a, a couple other guys like there was like a writer for Captain America and stuff that was out there. So it's it, it was yeah it was definitely interesting. There there was some fun cosplay too that we saw. I know there were like ten droids that were just kind of rolling around. Um, yeah uh, yeah and and it was yeah. one of those things where it's like it's cool but it also gets loud after a while. My like, God oh, yeah, R two D down you know I mean? yeah and it's a mix right because when like you have like five droids pull up next to your booth it's like yeah. you're kind of excited because there's more people at your booth but then it's also distracting because there's yeah. just people just instantly peel away from your booth and go to like oh droids which, yeah. Uh, yeah 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 um, it's, it's fun but it's also kind of like uh, uh but oh the um on saturday night when i was uh uh walking past the main concourse area mm -hmm. It was, I witnessed a um, dance off. With, <laughs> yeah, with um, with uh, people in costumes, cosplayer dance off. You know, you know what? I, I saw a dance off too. Like there were, there were people doing like straight B boy moves, like yeah. on the floor, like, and a, a whole crowd circled around, like clapping. I think when I was heading to the parking lot. Yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. it was festive. It was a good festive uh, environment. Uh, Sunday was definitely much slower. Uh, Saturday. Oh, yeah the was the busiest day yeah fr uh, friday was was just steady friday. the whole time and then yeah. saturday was just chaotically busy and you're right sunday was like a much slower stream um but much like many sundays you you did have people who'd come by who had like stopped by on friday sure. and just walked away and then suddenly they're like oh no i need to get this book so um yeah, I, I'd say overall it's a good convention. Um, it's it was definitely more geared towards like fantasy and superheroes, um, yeah. just like the the audience in general there, um, which which is always kind of the main audience for most cons. Um, hopefully, yeah. they're, hopefully they're finally getting their legs because they were originally uh, Stan Lee's Kamikaze. Yeah, it was that for like the first five years. And then I think they adjusted to Stan Lee was still showing up, but it was no longer Stan Lee's. It was just L.A. Comic Con. So mm -hmm. I think they went through some rebranding um, and maybe they're maybe they're up and going with with a uh, with their best output this time. I, I'm, I will, we'll see how it is. Next yeah, year. I mean, attendance was impressive uh, considering just where L.A. Comic Con has been in the past. Like this is getting to like a big convention level you know I, I would definitely agree with that yeah cool um well so uh if there's anything else uh we didn't get to uh let us know paul but i mean i, th I think this has been really good just cool to chat I, I'm, I'm inspired to hear uh you know what inspires other people you know for everyone here has a has a different uh beginning uh, and and a different delve into why they're storytellers or illustrators uh, they're all there's four different creators here, and they all have four different beginnings. So that's awesome to hear what people are inspired by, and, and it's awesome to see what people are like. Same same experiences, you know, being seeing Ray Bradbury in the same um, uh, theater, uh, getting the signature, uh, love for Twilight Zone. Um, it's that's just cool to to chit chat and 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 uh, jam out with uh, creators. Thanks awesome. for uh, talking. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, again, like you guys really need to pick up um, under the cottonwood tree, uh, El Suso de la Curandera, which I pronounced in the whitest, worst way. I wouldn't possible. even attempt at it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a really beautiful book. And uh, and it 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 does have um, it's it's like a bit bilingual. How would you describe it, Paul? Because it has like a, a 
yeah, yeah. definitely Spanglish. How I grew up, uh, um, you know, mostly English with a few Spanish words, and 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 there's specifically New Mexican Spanish, Spanish. So it's a uh, the local colloquialisms that that we say there. Um, and uh, but in the back there's a glossary for those words, so you don't have to know Spanish. Yes, uh, that's very helpful if you don't know Spanish in there. But it's it's like um, so far from reading it, it's it's been you know as somebody who's not like bilingual, it, it's very fluid and um, easy to understand and easy to follow. And and also it's cool because it um, much like Javier's work, like one of the things I love is highlighting uh like folklore and traditions um from other cultures i think is so important in comics and it's cool that you're doing that and representing that for for young kids um it's, it's funny with, with javier like like i remember i was when we we're talking to him um i'm like i remember showing up to some of i was telling him to some of his um uh, uh classes that he would conduct on like Latino history in comic books. And I was like, that was before I knew you and I never talked to you. And then now we're like, ah, we're, we're buds. And, it was, and so it's like, it's cool to see someone like Javier that's been doing it for, for much longer than I have. And then, and then now at the cons, we, we, we get to talk and, and meet up. So yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's an OG guy in the comic book world. Yeah. And like, uh, this, this actually would be good too, for just our listeners who haven't done a lot of cons. Um, when you go to a comic convention, be nice to people because, <laughs> because like, again, like if let's say I had met Paul and let's say hypothetically, I had a bad experience with Hav, which I haven't, nobody has Hav is amazing, but let's say I had some kind of bitter thing about, or I just didn't like Javier's work or something. And then I said that to Paul. Yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. Instantly you're leaving a bad impression because Paul's friends with Hav, yeah. right? Like, and right. that is just a microcosm of what it's like at comic conventions in general. Like it's a small tight knit community. And so usually there's only like two degrees of separation between anyone <laughs> and For anyone, sure. um, you know, and, uh, and, and it's like uh, we, we had neighbors who um, were familiar with David Hartman stuff who we've had on the show. Oh, and, stuff. Cool. Um, and so there, there was a, the animator who I wish I could remember what he worked on. Do you, uh, do you remember? Well, anyhow, so he, Jack Corsman, it was something out there. that was, it's pretty. Popular. Yeah. I, 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 anyhow, he also was talking to me. He, he picked up a copy of my book and, and was talking about his desire to make horror comics. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you're in animation and horror comics. I was like, Oh, do you know, like David Hartman stuff? And he was like, I'm a huge fan. And so I told him about art casters and how we have um, David Hartman on every Halloween. But again, mm -hmm. like it, it's, it's smaller. It's a smaller community than, you know, so it's like building these relationships and these connections is really valuable too. And I, I think, uh, again, like I also was thankful to have a non crazy, uh, booth mate because, because there are times at cons where there's like a table next to you and you wouldn't feel comfortable leaving your table. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, it was really nice to just, um, overall impression to LA comic con. It was nice to have booth mates that weren't, like that sure. where I could like leave and go outside and not worry, you know? Yeah. I, I, my one, my one unfortunate experience uh, at a con was um, the booth next to us just tended to grow and grow and grow because all of a sudden I, I don't, it was like the boyfriend showed up and then the, the girlfriend and then the next thing I look over and there's like six people in that one little booth and I'm like, and they're crowding us out. And I'm like, uh, yeah. but you know, that, that's probably my, my worst or it, it wasn't horrible, but I'm like, I come on, we're <laughs> you're growing into our space, but but usually it, it there it's I've never come across any negative experience besides a growing booth, but yeah, well, and again, like with a story like that, it's it's part it, like you know we usually wouldn't name names, you know that right. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, my my worst uh, scenario was somebody had made a science project out of their booth, and so they had literally built the uh, the science project volcano, um, to draw attention to their booth. And not only that, they had a boom box and like one of those little blow horn things to get people to stop by their booth. And oh. so what it did was actually like all traffic that was directing towards our area suddenly just rerouted away. Cause yeah. it's like this obnoxious car salesman. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, that was my worst, my worst scenario at a, at a con. Um, I guess just to wrap it up, uh, Scott, you got a worst, uh, a worst booth neighbor. <laughs> uh, a con? 
No, um, I've had I've had pretty good luck with booth neighbors. Other yeah. than um, just <clears throat> stuff like there's a it's a fairly decent sized company. A couple fairly decent sized company that that do this thing, and and some maybe they don't even know, but they, to me it's like something you don't do. Where they've got they've got double sided banners. Mm. so you know so you've got your your booth here and their banner is up higher than yours so people come people would either come by and ask for stuff that i don't sell because they're uh, advertising their thing in your space or people would come to complain about their books i'm like yeah go over there and talk to them because i'm not <laughs> yeah that's not <laughs> unless you get, unless you get a commission and you're like all right every, every yeah. all right you get cut yeah. That's true. That's but, true. If you're getting their sales, I, I, that wouldn't be. Too yeah, bad. no, I didn't get any of that. But and then uh, the weird, I guess, kind of the this wasn't a like a, a booth neighbor or anything, but there was one con, and this is back when I made. You know, I I had these really elaborate booth setups and everything, and I had one that looked like a like a factory, like a conveyor belt and everything, and put this thing together. And somebody, somebody, I guess. I, I had left the booth. So my girlfriend at the time was there and somebody had just, I guess, just decided they were just going to sit on the, I guess they were trying to get a photo or something that yeah. they just decided they're going to sit on the thing. And the whole thing came crashing down that the whole table, Oh my goodness. which wasn't, which fine. Okay. You probably shouldn't have done that or whatever, but then they just took off. They didn't bother to, oh, I'm sorry. Like, you know, they just took off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, anyway, so I get back and the booth's all broken apart. I'm like, okay, so, you know, so. <laughs> That's just rude. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, Corey, um, I think you do have a bad booth neighbor story, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I don't name to... them, though. <laughs> yeah. Which is harder because I happened to teach at the same university as this individual. Oh no. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and uh yeah, he uh carnival barker style and he would like like I had to ask his wife at one point. I was like cuz I was trying to be cordial. Uh I was like, "Hey, um when you get a chance, would you mention to your husband that like if somebody is talking to me at my booth to not pull them into his booth because they uh -huh. are talking to me like it'd be like in the middle of the conversation he'd be like hey do you like books and it's like dude i was like or like <laughs> he would come over and like reroute somebody who was obviously going towards my thing and he'd he'd like put his hand on their shoulder and be like come over here i'm like dude, you're, <laughs> wow. like, what is going on anyway and i love it and he was bragging to every single person uh that because he wasn't even like in comics it was he he had just written a novel mm. and i don't even think he should have been an artist alley because there is no visual element to his book except for uh the cover of his book that he bragged to every single person that talks to him about how inexpensively he was able to rip this guy off he's like oh yeah, yeah. this got this whole cover like i just got it overseas i paid him like i paid him like 120 bucks and you know da -da -da -da. and i was like dude that is not the brag that you think it is like these yeah. people are in artist alley for a reason. Anyway. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Everything, everything about that guy. And it was the same thing that you were describing with the, with, with the, the bullhorn and the volcano. Like I just saw streams of people just skip right over him <laughs> and me and the person right next to me. And I'm just like, yeah. Oh my gosh. And then and across the, across the way, there was a dude just, his art was really cool, but it was all wood burning art. And so the entire time he was just wood burning while we were there. So the entire time it just smelled like smoke smell. and fire. <laughs> like, this is the smell of burning wood. <laughs> just the entire, I'm like, oh. Anyway. I, 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 with, with the loud experience, I think the one time I remember being at a con with my fiance and across the way was a, it was a metal poster guy. And then, you know, those metal posters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what he'd do is he would make it, make it, He'd go. He'd wave it and go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh! <laughs> so eventually, in my head, I just kept going like. It was like it was like uh, uh, it like my PTSD I mean, after. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh God! Stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was 
that was fun to kind of wrap it with just like a little bit of uh negativity i apologize for going there but but it's it's funny to hear like um bad experiences as well um uh, again, I think LA Comic Con is worth it, and I'd say if somebody was like in the LA area and they're considering doing it, it it's it's worth it. It's a little up there, like for somebody's maybe first con, but yeah. but it's but it's fun. Yeah. Um, uh, well, Paul, it was awesome meeting you. Um, it was also just fun discovering uh, another uh, great writer, and and so um, again, uh, we'll 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 make the rounds and let everybody know where to find everything. But why don't we start with um with you, Paul? Where can everybody find your work? Where can they follow you? Um, obviously, uh, there's a link below that everybody can go to. But uh, Paul, why don't you let people know where they can get uh, this book? For sure, and just yeah, uh, uh, you, you, the link is down there. But under you Google under the comment tree or utctbook.com. Um, you can, or if you would like to purchase a book, we have sell them PDFs or we sell them individually, or maybe they're in your local library and check them out there. Um, um, so that's pretty much where I am now. And, and, uh, uh, uh I, uh, I'm just, I'm, I don't have my own little name, uh, to, to push. It's, it's more about the book right now. And hopefully there, there's a, hopefully there'll be a series of them as well. Um, and keep an eye out for the that, that Latinx uh, Lat, Latino graphics uh, volume that's going to come out, and uh, it's a lot of Latino uh, um, um, writers and illustrators, and that's going to be out of uh, OSU Press. Oh, sorry, nice. Press, yeah. Um, and, I love and thank it. you for having me, guys. This is cool. No problem. Um, all right, and uh, Corey, where can everybody uh, find your stuff if they're curious? Yeah, you can find my stuff at CoreyKerr.com. And if you want to see uh, me finish this that I started during the show, um, uh -huh. then get on uh, get on my email newsletter, which is at CoreyKerr.com slash email. And uh, see how I tie this supposedly ancient fable to, uh, to modern times. I love it. Um, all right. Uh, when I'm not being buried in the sand in my local area, <laughs> um, uh, I, I do graphic novels. So check out, uh, Jacob's apartment and two stories, my two graphic novels. Um, and if you want to do me a big solid and actually, while you're at it, do Paula solid here too. go to your local library, ask them to order yes. this book under the cottonwood tree. Right. And, um, after that, uh, ask them to order Jacob's apartment. Um, libraries actually tend to do that if you do uh, ask, and that's cool. It gets your book available to more people. So um, uh, that'll uh, you're on my channel otherwise, and you know where to find me if you haven't subscribed and hit the bell and all that. And then Scott, um, it's weird. Artcasters is on my channel today. It's on your channel possibly next week, possibly like three weeks from now. It's it kind of bounces from all our channels. Um, so that can be confusing. But before that, if I'm curious about how to make comics and uh, looking for resources and stuff like that, um, where should I go, Scott? Yeah, so you can go to my YouTube channel and you can, uh, once you're there, you will find a playlist that has uh, a show called Making Comics 101. And it's pretty much what it says. It's, it's I mean, it's the basics, but it's also, even if you're an industry professional, I think there's stuff in there that you're going to get some value from no matter what level you're at. But it is a kind of soup to nuts course on how to make comics, everything from coming up with your idea all the way to printing, publishing, and every step in between. Uh, there's there's the regular episodes, and then there's some like bonus episodes, and there's a little deep dive there. But um, yeah, check it out. Uh, you can either watch it all the way through, or you can just pick out, oh, I want to learn about inking, or oh, I want to learn about uh, plotting, or something like that. And and each and there's an episode for each one of those. So check that out. Uh, also, you can go to my website, and uh, I, I have right now, currently, which will not last too much longer, but uh, all my digital products for making comics, like the comic book, uh, comic maker toolkit, the amazing comic book world builder the hero design studio, all these tools for making comics, uh, digital tools are available half off right now. Um, so check that out. And as Josh alluded to the show, we do the art casters. We do the show 
pretty much every single week, but it does rotate between all three of the host channels, uh, which can get a little confusing, but in order to make it not so confusing, we have a mailing list. And what happens if you join that mailing list, there's a link in the description. It'll tell you exactly, you know, usually about 30 minutes before we go live, uh, we'll send out an email. It'll tell you who the guest is going to be, what the topic is going to be, um, whose channel is going to be on. So you always know because YouTube doesn't always alert people. So definitely uh, sign up for that if you already haven't. So. Awesome. And uh, thanks to everybody uh, who joined us in the chats, uh, Gary, Philip, uh, Keeman. Um, it, it's it's uh, fun. I know there's other people watching and stuff like that. If you're watching this after the fact, uh, we appreciate you guys. We appreciate um, uh, also last minute. Again, I want to shout out Jimmy, our listener who stopped by at LA Comic Con. It's awesome. And we appreciate you guys. Um, and again, thank you to Paul. And we will see you guys on the next uh, stream. So. Goodbye. See you then.